Hello everyone, Books with Banks back again with another video. This week I want to kick off a new series I'll be doing uh, possibly all year. While I've read and reviewed all of Shakespeare's ten main history plays, uh, there are still quite a few of his other two genres, the comedies and the tragedies, that I have yet to read or see or interact with in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so I want to go through the backlog of 12 or so works uh, that I know relatively nothing about, give them a read, and discuss them here on my channel. I want to do one video every month wherein I talk about two plays, a double feature kind of, uh, where I'll talk about one comedy and one tragedy. Uh, and then as we get six or so months in and I've caught up with everything, uh, well then I'll probably start to go back and reread some of the ones I don't remember that well, some of the ones I might have read uh, closer to when I was in high school, things like that. Uh, I also might uh, start reading some of the ones I've only seen productions of. Uh, so, if all that sounds fun and you haven't already, please like and subscribe and share your thoughts on these plays if you feel strongly any which way about them. For today, our comedy is Two Gentlemen of Verona and our tragedy is Titus Andronicus. Uh, these are two of Shakespeare's earlier plays, uh, written and first performed likely between like 1591-1594. Uh, for some context, Shakespeare wrote the comedies Taming of the Shrew and Comedy of Errors around this time. Uh, he also wrote the Henry VI plays around now. Uh, and from what I can understand, Titus Andronicus was likely his first to be categorized as a tragedy. Um, or at, at least the first play he wrote that would be categorized that way in the first folio kind of collection in like 1623, something like that. Anyway, uh, basically, with Two Gentlemen and Titus, we've got two of Shakespeare's earlier works here. Uh, both of these are often ranked near the bottom of people's favorite Shakespeare lists, uh, as, as in the bottom, not like they're their favorites, but the bottom and far from their favorites. Uh, a lot of people consider these two of his weaker plays. Uh, and I think I can definitely understand why, uh, but I hope that doesn't keep anyone watching this uh, who's curious about these uh, from checking them out for yourself, uh, as there's always at least some fun to be had with Shakespeare, uh, even when the rest of his works might be technically uh, more well done or more inter entertaining. So, let's talk about the comedy first. Two Gentlemen of Verona. Uh, first, what's it about? Uh, so you have two young men from Verona, Valentine and Proteus. Uh, they are sent away to spend time in the court of a duke in Milan. Uh, there, Valentine falls in love with the duke's daughter, Sylvia. But Proteus, his friend, also falls in love with Sylvia. But Proteus's situation is more complicated. Uh, as he has just left a love and girlfriend behind in Verona, this young woman named Julia. Julia disguises herself as a young boy and follows Proteus to Milan to sadly discover that uh, Proteus has now apparently forgotten all about her uh, and he's lusting after his best friend's love interest. All throughout the play, uh, most of these characters uh, each have one servant, uh, and the servants' commentaries are often about how ridiculous and shallow these young adults are behaving. Uh, the dialogue between servants was easily my favorite aspect of the play, uh, as they're sort of playing at being idiots, kind of, uh, but none of them are as dumb as the nobles that they serve. Um, Speed and Lance, Valentine and Proteus' servants, respectively, uh, these two have a few fun exchanges where it seems like they're intentionally trying to confuse each other um, and pretend like they, they're not understanding what the other one's saying. Uh, so some of their exchanges are, are pretty entertaining. Uh, I think one of my biggest takeaways from this play, however, was the confused and contradictory portrayal of its women. Uh, on the one hand, you have Sylvia, who's uh, the young um, daughter of, of uh, the Duke of Milan. Uh, yeah, the young daughter of the Duke of Milan. Um, and she knows what she wants, uh, or rather she knows who she wants. Uh, and she is also capable of figuring out, as the play goes along, just how disloyal and unkind and untrustworthy Proteus has been. Uh, on the other hand, you have Julia, who is frustrating to say the least. 
uh, she's way too forgiving and way too in love with Proteus to ever make sense uh, or for this to be a realistic portrayal of a woman or of a person uh, in general. Uh, I would love to see or find an adaptation of this play that portrays the Julia character in a really fun or exciting way, but given this script, I'm just not sure how possible that is. Um, also, I think the struggles uh, a bit for being one of Shakespeare's earlier comedies. I'm wondering if things just wrap up so quickly and so perfectly with everyone all of a sudden changing their minds, finding each other, forgiving each other, all in less than like half a scene. Uh, it's kind of like watching a rom-com where let's say one of the characters is a horrible boyfriend and even worse best friend, but he still gets a happy ending because everyone gets a happy ending in this one. It's just really weird. Uh, the play suffers too in that I've read and watched other later Shakespeare comedies uh, and it really feels like in Two Gentlemen he's uh, trying, or Shakespeare's trying out a few things that he then improve upon in later plays. So should you read Two Gentlemen of Verona? Uh, if you're a completionist and or you're trying to do something like what I'm doing here, sure. Uh, but otherwise, I don't really think so. Uh, I definitely wouldn't recommend it to anyone on the strength of the main characters or any of their big scenes. Uh, but as I mentioned before, I did get a kick out of some of the dis dissembling banter of the servants. Uh, so there is some fun to be had here. But um, really, the play is kind of bogged down by the rest of a pretty lackluster play. Uh, by, the end, by the end, I dare say I was a little bored, actually. Which is something I doubt anyone has ever said about this month's tragedy, Titus Andronicus. Jeez, what a crazy play. Uh, this, this one's nuts. Um, uh, I knew it was going to be a little crazy, uh, a little bloodier than even the darkest of Shakespeare's other tragedies. I had heard this, um, but Titus Andronicus is absolutely wild. Uh, I might have laughed at the sheer absurdity in Titus, actually, more than I laughed at anything in Two Gentlemen of Verona. Uh, but first, a quick synopsis. So, in Titus Andronicus... You have two brothers, Saturninus and Bassianus. Uh, the, these are the sons of the deceased emperor, recently deceased emperor, and these two are politicking and making their speeches to try to become the next emperor. In walks Titus Andronicus, an older man, a war hero. Um, they say he could be emperor, everyone would get behind him and support him, but Titus refuses. Um, and he appoints Saturninus. Uh, it's kind of given up to him. Or it's kind of left up to him which of the two of the former emperor's sons gets to rule. Titus chooses Saturninus. Uh, also, when Titus comes back into town, um, he comes back from war against the Goths. Uh, but he and his four remaining sons, out of originally 25, 21 of which died in the wars, um, Titus and his sons, they have brought back prisoners in uh, Tamora, the queen of the Goths, and... Uh, three of her sons, Demetrius and Chiron, who they let live, or Chiron, uh, who they let live, uh, but there's a third son uh, of, of Tamora's whom they sacrifice, uh, who they kill. Now, Tamora is on a revenge quest against Titus and his family because they um, just killed her son and they were already prisoners. They were already defeated. Uh, now, there's some background I think we might be missing, uh, or maybe that could be filled in with like stage direction, nuance of performance, things like this. Basically the things uh, that a Shakespeare scholar Dr. Emma Smith calls gappiness in her book This is Shakespeare. Um, one of these gaps uh, is that it, it seems that Titus's daughter Lavinia and Bassianus, now the emperor's brother, because he wasn't the one that Titus appointed, um, it seems that Bassianus and Lavinia, that they're in love, uh, but Titus quickly agrees to let Saturninus marry his daughter instead of Bassianus. Uh, and so then Lavinia's brothers, Titus' sons, um, they attempt to kind of sneak Lavinia away so that she can be with Bassianus instead of uh, Saturninus. And Titus feels betrayed and ashamed of this, uh, then kind of forcing him to break his word. Um, by promising his daughter to Saturninus. So Titus just straight up murders one of his four sons. Uh, and Emperor Saturninus is like, uh, nope, there's way too much drama in 
that family and the um, Titus Andronicus family. Um, so my brother, Bastianus, you can have Lavinia, have fun. Um, and I'll marry this beautiful and mysterious Tamora prisoner, queen of gods instead. Uh, so now the stage is set for Tamora to seek her revenge on Titus's family and for Titus to rapidly go more and more insane. This path starting with his embarrassing fit of rage and the murder of his son. Uh, there are, are a few other characters I should mention here. Uh, first, there's Marcus, uh, Titus's brother. And Marcus seems the most level-headed, maybe the most like an audience or reader surrogate here. Um, at least that's how I read him. Uh, there's a lot of times throughout the play, someone will say something a little bit crazy, and instead of leaving us to wonder if that's supposed to indicate insanity, or if, you know, we're just, just misunderstanding uh, Shakespeare's uh, writing, or we're misunderstanding the line, uh, Marcus comes along and comments on how tragic and insane the whole situation actually uh, is. Um, so that's one character. Um, he's a, kind of a constant presence uh, throughout the play. And then we have Aaron. And Aaron is a goth prisoner that who was brought in with Tamora and her sons. Uh, it turns out he's actually in a romantic relationship with Tamora. There's this whole thing about eventually in the play about she has a son. It's supposed to be Saturninus is the emperor's, but the son is black because Aaron's black. Um, and that's its whole thing. Um, kind of off that point, Aaron occupies a fascinating position in this play as he is a manipulative villain only egging on Tamora and her sons in their attempts to totally destroy Titus and his family. Aaron has the unfortunate description of being black and his character matching the color of his skin. Um, this really uh, terrible kind of stereotype, a way to write characters. Uh, it's no small leap to point out this kind of racist portrayal here, uh, but I am curious if there's been any studies on this character in particular and how he's portrayed. Uh, it is interesting that even though there's plenty of murder, rape, mutilation, and even some cannibalism in this play, uh, this villainous manipulative Aaron character, uh, I think he only kills one person if I remember right, um, and that being uh, Bassianus, the emperor's brother. Um, and uh, Lavinia's lover. Um, so Aaron's villainy is more of a behind-the-scenes manipulative type compared to how violent and cruel the rest of the cast is. Um, and I guess that makes him stand out um, when all the other characters are assaulting each other so frequently throughout. Um, an interesting character, uh, but definitely uh, a problematic one, uh, and I'd be very curious to see how he's portrayed in modern adaptations. Uh, also, it's weird to give a content warning for a Shakespeare play, uh, but I definitely say this play warrants one. Uh, there is a rape scene that happens, uh, though the rape itself happens off stage uh, or off page, as it were. Um, there is uh, plenty of planning and disgusting dialogue between Tamora's despicable sons and Aaron about how to do the rape uh, and how proud they are after having done it. Uh, there's also this horrible fact that the young victim here uh, has her, she's not only uh, sexually assaulted, she has her tongue cut out and her hands cut off so she can't communicate how or who did this to her. So it's really, really brutal stuff. This is kind of what I mean when I say this play is absolutely wild. Um, at least for me, uh, everything surrounding this rape was th the darkest part of the play, uh, and it's actually uh, not handled super poorly. Um, like, I, I think the script itself has no qualms about showing and describing this act as as horrific as it is, as it would be today, uh, you know? Um, it's, it's a terrible thing. Um, and um, the, there's also a lot of conversation about how devastated Lavinia's family is kind of for her. Um, and yeah. Uh, now, Titus definitely takes things a little bit too far, um, as is kind of his pattern. Uh, and uh, there's also a bit of this, with his kind of twisted mindset, this like, oh no, the rape of my daughter causes me such pain. I'm in such pain and how do I solve my thing? And less focus on the pain she's in. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm also not sure exactly how someone would play Lavinia after the attack uh, in a modern adaptation. I'd be really curious to see um, see how that's portrayed as, as well. Uh, but yeah, 
really bizarre, insanely violent little play, uh, and what Titus does in the end, well, by that point, after being beaten over the head with the violence and the horror of everything, uh, I actually think it's kind of hilarious. Um, and I'm curious what audiences thought about this play back then, uh, and Titus's final uh, little revenge spree. Um, yeah, so there you have it. Uh, I think I'll end my rambling thoughts there. Those were the first two plays I read in this double feature Shakespeare series I'm doing. Uh, I'm tossing around a few options for next month. Uh, I'll try to do one more comedy and one more tragedy uh, out of the ten or so I haven't read now. Uh, for the comedy, I'm thinking either Love, Slavers, Lost or Twelfth Night, and for the tragedy, uh, maybe something like Coriolanus or uh, Timon of Athens. Uh, so let me know which of those you'd like me to cover, uh, which ones you'd like me to read and give a brief recap of. Also go ahead and let me know down below what are your favorite and least favorite Shakespeare plays. Um, and also, uh, are there any plays maybe you didn't like when you read, uh, but then you loved a certain production of them? I always love hearing things like that when it comes to, comes to Shakespeare. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Have a great day. Bye.